welcome everybody. It feels like it's been eternity since we were together, all together, the musketeers. Too long. The three of us. Too long. Three long. The three of us now. Three long. Did you have a nice holiday, John? Great holiday, yeah, fantastic. Mm. Really was, good. Was, was everything intact at the house when you got back? In nothing what miss, sense? Nothing missing. Were well, you telling me that you broke into my house? <laughs> <while I'm laughs> I, it's good that John obviously listens to the <laughs> podcast when he's away because um, w Will started an appeal for people to break into your house while you're on holiday <laughs> and told them where you lived, oh um, which I the door might I don't know what they could steal from my house that's of any value whatsoever. I told them where the spare key was under the flower pot around the back. <laughs> But that's like, you, I, mean, I mean, people would listen to that and think, well, Will's just, that's where everybody's spare key is. Where do you leave your no, spare key? Told them Under which flower a flower pot. pot. Yeah. Really, which one? Uh, that pink one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Uh, but everything, not. everything's still there in one piece. That's good. Yeah, no, it's fine. And yeah. if anything has been stolen, I've, I've, I've not realised. It either shows <laughs> that no one listens to the podcast or there's just no robbers, no thugs. Or they've stolen something of such <laughs> Little small <insignificant>. value. <laughs> Actually, I had a James Martin cookbook that I've not seen for a while. <laughs> yeah, I've not seen that. Should we start an appeal to oh get James, God. James Martin cookbook? That could be it. Somebody stole my cookbook. I wonder if it was James Martin. <laughs> well, how good would it be if your house got robbed by James Martin? He stole his own cookbook. <laughs> and um, signed it and then put it back. Um, so you can stop smiling now because obviously, you know, what we like to do when you're here, John, um, is Great. bring a bit of correspondence to the, to the podcast. And I know you're, you're a little bit sick of it, but... Um, firstly, just before we get to some, some tweets and some messages from your, your fans, yep. um, you've had a bit of a go at Zach Hardacre from, no. from your ivory tower. No, I haven't. I haven't. Right, I'll, I'm going to call fake. This is fake the news? biggest amount of fake news ever. Mm. I got asked, was it a surprise that Leeds had signed Zach Hardacre? And what I said was, the question is for Leeds, really, mm. whether they have, like, a brand value that they think bringing Zach in would challenge that. Mm. And that's up to them. Too flawed know? to be a role model? No, no, no. I said, I said, who decided sports people are role models? Because when, when you get in a position where you're good at sport, you're just good at sport. Mm. But by definition, you become a role model. Mm. And then people start analyzing you like you're a role model. But I'm saying not everybody is a role model who plays sport. Are you a role model? Probably not. Mm. We're all flawed, aren't we, in some way? And I just think there's like 1% of sports people who are role models, really, genuinely, like, live that perfect. So like, you can think of them like maybe Roger Federer, Lionel Messi. There's a few Messi. more than 1%, but yeah. it's, it's a minority. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I, yeah. Well, it's for all you know, Roger Federer could electrocute guinea pigs in his, yeah, in his dungeon. I thought we saw it with Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods was held out. When I was coming up as a junior, Tiger Woods was used as the example of how you should conduct yourself as a sportsman. Then he had loads of affairs and crashed his car into a tree. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Under the influence. <laughs> Allegedly. Um, look, we, we want to get to our guest very quick. It's very rude because if you're watching, it's already awkward because our guest just sat there just in silence. But if you're listening, we keep you in suspense. But just a bit of correspondence, John, um, for you since the, the, the last time you were here. Um, it's a bit like a sort of agony aunt section, this, isn't it? I, it's not, like I it. don't know if it is, Will. I um, think it's cathartic for you. <laughs> I do like more it. So, more do so like than it. anybody else. Uh, Laurie says, wonder if John Wilkin has an opinion on Blake Ferguson signing to Lee. Um, Rufus Rebel 13 says, what a bell end John Wilkin is. <laughs> Adam FFS, which I think stands for for fuck's sake. Please mute John Wilkin. He talks complete shite. <laughs> John says, any chance, please, John Wilkin, will let Bill commentate. Anything that could be said in one sentence becomes a full speech. Um, <laughs> Weasel says, John Wilkin making Phil Clark seem knowledgeable and insightful. Oh Hashtag, the man is a dick. That's well, a good one. Yeah. Great Twitter name as well. Um, Joe, simply, <laughs> Joe simply writes, John Wilkin and the eye roll emoji. Uh, um, truth talking RL, stop giving airtime to this guy. He's a complete toss pot. Uh, Joe says, Wilkin is the most overrated of the Super League era and horrendous pundit with biased opinions. And Nick, I do like this one as well, just finally, Nick writes, John Wilkin in the commentary box if Leeds win, and then a picture of Randy Marsh from South Park covered in cum. All right. Can I just add to that? We've had a lot of reviews on uh, podcasts and YouTube as well. Mm. I just want to read one out. It's titled The Best Podcast in the World, and it starts with, Will Perry is the best ever, Mike Flanagan doesn't say much, and John Wilkin is a W star N... K E R. Now, John, I just want to ask you a question. <laughs> Out of the three of us on this couch, who do you think wrote that well, review I, I for think... for 
Well, I, I think we all know the answer. Do you, d- it's Will, Do we it? think it's quite sad that Will what, writes no, his no, own reviews and gives Will, himself five stars? What Will's done is created a situation where he's given airtime to people like this. So, <laughs> de facto, you know, creating, that, a situation, <laughs> creating a situation where more people are likely to... Yeah. You know, well, they know it's going to be. We're not. We're not in. A, we're not in the industry to be liked, Will, as you know. No, I mean, we're not in the as, industry. As you know, we? we're not in the industry. As you know, full <laughs> stop. Anyway, look. Uh, this week we are joined by the Wakefield Trinity head coach, Mr. Willie Poaching, John and Mark. Willie Poaching. Willie Willie Poaching. Poaching. Welcome. Cheers, Welcome. gents. Thanks that for having was, us. I mean, if you haven't heard the podcast before, that's just kind of a little thing that happens when John's here. Only when John's here, because <laughs> when you put my, my Mike and uh, and our names into um, to, to, there's not a lot. There's not a lot out there. Willie, how the hell are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks it's for having us. So good of you to come in. Thank you so much. Because you're still living in, in Wakefield all these years on. You've been there, what, 20 years? Yeah, 23 years, I think. Oh. Almost at Wakey, yeah. And uh, it's been a, a good place for us. The, the town's been good to us. Yeah. It's been good to my family. My my three boys were raised there, um, going through good schools and proud that they've got a really good circle of friends, friends each and every one of them. So yeah. I'm, I'm really proud to have lived in the town for as long as we have because it's in, you know hopefully I've given it something but it's yeah. given me me and my family a lot Willie I've got so much to ask you um, and I, I guess the, the, the place to start really is is right at the beginning and there's do you know what I've tried to do some reading up on you and I couldn't find much sort of before you came to Wakefield so I'm really interested to hear about your sort of early years you were born in New Zealand yep yeah um, Samoan heritage yep where does the Samoan heritage come from Which uh, mum and dad were both born there uh, dad uh, and my grandmother decided to uh, move my family over, move all her kids, all nine of them, across to New Zealand. Um, and they came about 1952. Uh, my mum's family came across around a little bit later in the 50s, um, but still regarded as the early migration of Samoans to come to New Zealand. So when I look back, they're my heroes, my grandparents to have done what they did to move. My my mum's family's seven kids, my dad's family's nine kids, and to move that many kids, to sacrifice everything you know for the betterment of your children mm. to a country you know nothing about. At that time, neither of them had family there and they knew nothing of the language. Mm. The, my grandparents or my dad and his siblings. So to make that sacrifice and the hope that you're going to give your kids a better life um, it's a massive sacrifice and a massive thing to do. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've always held my grandparents in, in heroic regard because of what they did for my parents and, in turn, what they've done for me and my generation and, and what goes on following me. Mm. And w- what was the motivation for, you know, that migration of people from Samoa to New Zealand? It's obviously such a strong... Sort yeah, of work. Yep. Work was a big one. Work, education. Um, as I say, just... There's not a lot in Samoa. Um, there wasn't um, at the time either. Um, but my, my grandmother sent my dad's oldest brother across to check it out. Put some feelers out. Put some feelers out, find a job, <laughs> try and set a base. Bit of a rat bag. Yeah. Didn't, do, didn't do what my grandmother <laughs> wanted, so she packed up all the other kids and followed and said, all right, we'll just set it up ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go and do it. So The, the recce yeah. didn't go well. <laughs> no, no, not at all. He's not been in touch for weeks. <laughs> Where is he? No. <laughs> He's in Auckland. Eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go find him. <laughs> what, what was that like then, the, the upbringing? Was it obviously you know, growing up in New Zealand, but obviously a very Samoan upbringing? And, and for, like, there's a lot of idiots to listen to this podcast, as you can get the feeling from from the tweets that we had earlier on T- tell us what you know a, a Samoan upbringing a Samoan family is like well at the time as I say there weren't many Samoans and they were the early, some of the early ones to go um, and it wasn't the most welcoming place for them at the time mm. that I understand from stories I've been retold um, so to try and mix and fit in they weren't encouraged to speak Samoan at home, yeah, fine, but at school and around the place. So growing up, the second generation, we we didn't get to learn a lot of it, and we've tried to pick it up as we've grown. Mm-hmm. But because my grandparents encouraged English to be spoken and to fit in at school, and and the knowledge that when they send their kids out to school, they're going to feel safe and they're going to get no repercussions or backlashes from anybody at school for being a foreigner. Um, 
So that's where we were. We, we didn't really have the Samoan lifestyle. Um, we understood the traditions and we tried to live the traditions with the other Samoan families that were around. So we've held on to that. But behind it all, regardless of all that, my dad always taught us who we were and how proud we should be of who we are and what we follow and who we come after. Yeah. So, yeah, we're really proud of the traditions that we have. And one of my jobs here now is sort of following what my grandparents did coming over into a new country and my children growing up here is to pass that on to them. And I'm, I'm really proud that they're proud of their heritage and they try and carry some of that even though they're over, over here with very few others around them of, mm. you know, of their culture. What about your dad? You mentioned him there. Tell us about Eddie because he sounds like an amazing man. I know he died in 2014, but yeah. what, what an incredible inspiration for you as a kid. Massive sportsman, um, sprinter, um, as a young fella. You didn't uh, get any, you weren't quick. No, nah, my sister got it. Uh, <laughs> neither me or my brother got any of that. Uh, we got his, his big legs. Yeah, I need uh, them. Um, but he was only a short fella. He was only a little fella. And he, uh, he, play, he was an athlete. And the guy in charge of his athletic club was also in charge of a rugby league club. So when he was younger, he thought, oh, I think I could use this kid. So he invited my dad down and said, why don't you come and play rugby league, this game, we've got this club, we've got a team. And obviously it was massively union Samoa, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. not at the time. It wasn't, sport wasn't really as big. It is now. Mm. Um, but we didn't know anything about rugby league. But then he went and played, uh, followed by my uncles, then followed by my cousins, and then it almost seemed natural for me and my brother to, to follow in those footsteps. So mm. that's how we got into rugby league. But yeah, it was really, really big in sport. I'd... Uh, I didn't really see a lot of him um, play. I saw him play once. He was a manager for a team that uh, he was coaching, or that his brother was coaching. Uh, they were short, and he jumped on the wing one day, and my mum wasn't too happy, so I, he never played again. But um, <laughs> he became more of an administrator and more renowned for, for being an administrator, more so for our club in New Zealand, but for Samoa Rugby League and being one of the pioneers to help kickstart Pacific Rugby League and Rugby League for individual Pacific nations. So I think the Pacific, first Pacific Cup was about 1986. Um, That's crazy. The first yeah. Tongan Isn't it Samoan? crazy, that? Yeah. I, you know, I didn't know that. Yep. That seems ridiculously late in the yep. timeline for me that, you know, like looking at the influence now that, that Pacific Islands have upon, uh, not, not just rugby league, but the world of sport. No. Like for 1986. Yep. Mm. That was the first time that it was established. Yeah, first that, time there was ever a Samoan team. Wow. And went across and played the Cook Islands, New Zealand Maori, and uh, they sort of kick-started that Pacific tournament. Yeah. So, yeah, it gave the team, countries an identity, gave them an identity in rugby league, and gave people like Yesenia Faimalu, who played for New Zealand, gave him a chance to yeah. represent his parents. Uh, Solomon, who did the same. Uh, my son actually showed me a photo the other day of that team that first went, and some of the names were were amazing, you know, mm. Kiwis that before that would never have got a chance. Yeah. But they were the pioneers for us. They are the ones yeah. that, that, f that I was able to follow. And as you say, now you look at the NRL and the numbers of Pacific Islanders, it's ridiculous yeah. from what it was. And you know, I remember the early days when there was a handful, there was Olsen Filipina, a guy called John Fafita, mm. um, Fred Arkoy, uh, very few yeah. um, for myself to follow. Um, but nowadays, you know, it's over eight. half, I think, in the NRL, isn't it? It's getting over yeah, half, yeah. 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 It's, you know, the numbers are really, really high. Yeah. And you know, my dad always said, my dad said that our game was always perfect for our people. Mm. We're not a tall race. So the very few line-out jumpers, um, whilst rugby, rugby union is predominant, rugby league was always a game that we could play. It suited our physique, suited our temperament. And yeah, I think he's uh, pretty, pretty yeah, right there. On with that, yeah. When you talk about your dad's legacy, I, I remember reading that <clears throat> you're so proud of him because he gave young guys a chance, believed in them, got them off the streets in some cases, yep. kept some of them alive, gave them a, a, a future, gave them a, a career, and, and, and they yeah. have so much to thank your dad. Um, I probably happen around between under 11s and under 15s, even under 16s. This um, back in Auckland. Back in Auckland, yep. my dad. Uh, Worked in a fish factory, so he was gone. I never, I can't remember a weekday having breakfast with him. He was gone to work straight away. Um, then he'd come home and I'd meet him at the shop. 
down the road. We had drive past, pick up me and my cousin. And then we just did the rounds around Auckland, picking up all my teammates mm -hmm. that he'd recruited to come and, and play. One of them was almost an hour away. Um, train and do the same on the reverse. We'd drop them all off. It sounds like Ocean's Eleven, just picking up all the, the guys. Almost, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All the crew. Yeah, and I, I didn't think of it at the time. I didn't think about the impact that that was having. I, all I thought about was, man, Dad's got these good kids for our team and we've got a pretty gun side. Mm. Um, these big island kids from a place called Otara, which is pretty rough. And it wasn't until my, uh, we had my dad's celebration after he passed away and one of my old teammates stood up and spoke and he, he spoke of the impact that Dad had on him. And because of his surroundings and where he grew up, the game taught him discipline, the game showed him some love and, you know, took him off the streets. Yeah, because it's quite a big gang problem in certain areas of Auckland, isn't there? There's quite sketchy neighbourhoods. I remember visiting it with, like, Polynesian gangs quite, quite yeah, common. Yeah, and there is a, there is a big difference mm. in socioeconomic areas. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's an expensive place now, as yeah. I understand. I've been away 23 years, but I, I read the New Zealand Herald every day and I read about how much it's costing to live and that's having an impact on some of the younger people who, you know, who haven't quite got the education to go and get the right jobs, but they're having to resort to crime and to gangs mm. for that nurturing and for that support and for that income. And it's, and it's sad, but, you know, I was so proud that when he said that at my dad's celebration, that, that was the impact that dad had on him. Where, where did that come from in your dad, that sort of Coach Carter figure, to, to want to improve people's lives like that? Because, I mean, look, we need more Eddie Poachings around, don't we? Um, he always used to tell me, as an athlete, he'd run at meetings all around town, around Auckland, and sometimes it'd be a little way away. And my grandmother never drove, but she would walk all day to take him food and support him and then walk home again. And everywhere that he went, and she'd never miss a race, she'd never miss a game, she always supported him. Uh, probably helped that he was the baby of the family and he, he got the support from my grandmother, but it was that sort of support that he thought he had to pass on as well, I think, um, as well as trying to get the best kids for our team that were out there. So, yeah, it, you know, he passed it on to me and try and do that for my kids and, you know, it's just about paying it forward, I think. Mm. Strong family values are it's so important to a lot of Polynesian people I've met, I think you'll agree, John, the lads you've played with, whether it's Saints, Salford or whatever, the Polynesians are always want to get together, look after the younger kids, give lifts to training for younger players, do everything they can. It's quite, it's a bit of a, a cultural um, norm with, with those people, isn't it? And your people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that's how we're brought up. Mm. You know, you, you get looked after yeah. by your, your brothers and your cousins and, you know, they take you everywhere, they teach you the ropes and um, especially being over here, there's a responsibility on on us that have been here for a little while um, to show the new ones the ropes and look after them and make sure everything's all right, which is why uh, I'm really proud that Carl Hall started up the Pacific Welfare Branch of Rugby League Cares. Mm. And we sort of... Uh, I sit with him and Feka Paliasina and Kylie Luluai to do that. And well, not officially, but... Um, to sort of let them know that there's a support mechanism for them, their wives, their kids, um, just so they know the ins and outs, because it's very different living here. Mm. There's a lot of things you're not told, um, simple things like car tax, TV licences. Yeah. Um, I've known plenty of guys that have come across that have been pulled over by the cops, and you don't have to insure your car at home. It's mm. not compulsory in New Zealand. So they get caught in that trap. So it's just about educating them. That's the responsibility I feel I have on the next lot coming through and the ones after them. But yeah, we, we try and look after each other. We try and look out for each other and be a support network. And as it goes, after long enough, you become family to yeah. each other. What are those emotions, so John, when, yeah. when you think back to those days with your dad and going around and a young Willie and you obviously being coached by your, your dad as well. Yep. When you, when you think back to those days, what, what, does it, what does it bring back and all the things that he instilled in you? And I guess he was already brewing a, 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 a coach to be in, in yourself. Uh, maybe. I, I'm, I'm grateful, really grateful um, to have had the dad that I have and had and this, the sport that I had from him um, and the gentleman that he was. He was a softly spoken man. As I say, he was a little fella, but 
uh, you know, I'm really proud of everything that he did for me, my brother, my sister, and my mum, and how hard he worked for us, and, and the values that he taught us. And you now I miss him every day. I still talk to him every now and again when I'm on the car. And uh, you know, I've tried to uh, pass on some of his teachings that he gave me to my boys now. Yeah, and how how much do you think the you know, Mark mentioned the family values and, and that you all get together as a community. How much do you think that's based around the fact that you've travelled, you know, you've migrated out of Samoa, you know, you, you've had to move to New Zealand and, and therefore had to sort of gather around each other. It's like a, maybe like a cultural sort of pass on as, you know, down to those next generations. Uh, I'm not sure. This started uh, when early 2000s. There was myself, Joe Vangana, Leslie Vainakolo, and Frankie Watani. Yeah. And we decided to sort of just catch up and every couple of weeks. But then the Solomonas came over, the Tajilalas came over, the Lautitis came over, Mortutoni came over. So all of a sudden there was a few more. And we sort of formalised it a bit where we caught up every six weeks. Yeah. And then we, we could see how morale boosting it was for the other guys to catch up, have a laugh, and just joke in our own way and be, yeah, yeah. be fools in our own way and and I could see it was helping a lot of them with homesickness so the girls started to do their own ones and that was sort of the base of where this is all kicked off we don't catch up unfortunately as much as we used to and there's a few more over this side of the hill and you know trying to get everyone together I think we've got one on the first of June a big catch up for everyone and yeah it's uh, it's tough to do it um, with as many people here now, but trying to catch up on the phone and do everything like that. But that was probably where it all started yeah. and recognising there's a lot of value in this. There's a lot of value and a lot of power in what we're doing for each other. I, I felt the love and support that we were getting on from some of that and it just helps. Yeah. Sure. But bearing in mind your dad was such a pioneer for Samoan rugby league players. And, he, and you touched on it there with some of those names. that You saw these guys play in the NRL in the UK and you know your dad was a huge influence in that happening for the, for these people and for, for generations to come afterwards and also bearing in mind that your dad watched you and we'll get to your career later Willie but win the grand final for Leeds against Bradford in 2004 and you know put you on that pedestal to be able to do that and, and losing him in 2014 that what an amazing moment that he got to see you do that yeah yeah um, and to follow the games that we had over here, that was, you know, it, um, I brought him across in 2003 for the Challenge Cup final. Mm. Um, it's probably the, one of the proudest things I was able to do for him, to bring him over. He used to speak to me about the Frano Bodicas and those sort of people. He, he sort of had an affiliation with their family and his dad and that, and how proud they would have been to see their son play at Wembley. Um, so to be able to bring dad over and, and double that with... My best mate Joe Vung and I bringing his dad over for the same game, so both of them being able to see us play and and go against each other. Um, yeah, that was a really proud moment for us to be able to do that for our dads who'd done so much for us. But yeah, yeah, it'd be nice to uh, to be able to bring him over, but he, he wasn't young at the time, and the trip took a lot out of him. And I was just really proud that he was able to get there. And I always remember him talking about the atmosphere and the singing and the chanting and mm. it was better than anything you could have imagined from watching all those Wembley finals even though it was at at Cardiff in the Millennium Stadium mm. it was still a moment that he never forgot mm. yeah I think it's one of the things you touched on there is it's incredibly tough being away from your family right you know if you're two hours away three hours away it's a different ball game when it's 24 hours or 32 hour flight away, isn't it? You know, it's, it just brings a different layer of challenge to that distance, doesn't it? No, and you think about it, and, and I had a chat to Dave Solomon a little while ago, and just saying probably one of the biggest differences he, he finds living in Brisbane is that he can jump on a flight at 10 o'clock and be home at lunchtime, be back in New Zealand, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, as you say, we don't get to do that. It's almost a day and a half's travel, and it's not just a matter of, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. It's, it's a big trick. And there's a lot of kids knocking around. It's yeah. expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
we're looking forward to going home sometime soon and, and seeing everyone, but you know, because of the cost and because of the, how hard the travel can be, um, those trips are fewer and further between. Yeah. You know, mm. what they used to be when, you know, when we were playing on players' wages. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the upside now is with the invention of Skype, FaceTime, you know. Game changers, isn't it? Game changers. Mm. Mate, I'd, I remember the first time we got here and the first week we arrived, we had arrived, we had arrived from Townsville where it was 35, 38 the degrees. Behold, uh, yeah, and the kids were only little. They didn't understand why they couldn't go running outside in the nude again, you know, like they were two weeks ago, um, stuck in the house where it was cold. Our first phone bill after three weeks was about 450 quid. <laughs> My missus just ringing home. We didn't know about, you know, uh, tariffs and trying to get packages from BT and those sorts of things, but you just did what you did. And so, you know, now I, my wife's at home at the moment and I can FaceTime her and it's cost her nothing. It's yeah. crazy compared no, to what it was. Mate. I've got, I've got, yeah. a, t- I've got yeah. a two, I've got a two month old, a two month, two year old nephew in, in Mallorca and he's, he calls me on FaceTime. It was like, you know, two in the, three in the morning. Yeah, he's yeah. calling, calling, calling. It's too intrusive. Now. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah. My mum's calling me like, fuck off, stop calling me. Um, look, bear in mind everything you've just said about, um, about your background there, Willie. How important was it for you to represent Samoa? Because I know you captained the junior Kiwis as a kid, and later on, I think it was the 2005 Tri Nations, yep. you played for New Zealand. But you captained Samoa at a World Cup in 2000 and, and played before that, before you got the captain's armband. You know, to, to do that and to, to lead your country out. Yeah, it was huge. Um, go back to 1986 when the team departed New Zealand for the Cook Islands for that tournament, the first Samoa team. And uh, we said goodbye to Dad. And my mum, my sister and I, we went to America uh, for a wedding. So we were away from Dad for a while. But I always remember thinking I wanted to go on that trip. I wanted to go with him, with the team. I wanted to be part of that team. And that stayed with me as I grew up as a kid. I I wanted to represent that team that my dad had helped start. And then I was able to play for them a couple of times on a New Zealand tour. But yeah, to to play for them at, at two World Cups and to cap, captain them, yeah, something else. Um, and even more special that dad was a manager of the team still and he was he was able to be there and hand me my jersey. And yeah, special moments that you hold on to. But by the same token, it was, it was special for me to play for the country that I grew up grew up in because you know, before that team that taken off in 1986 from when I started there was only the Kiwis and you know, that's who I first wanted to represent so to be able to do both is special and you know something I'll, I'll be able to hold on to forever. Yeah. Um, you obviously came over to England and you left the NRL you left St George before the merge with St George Lawara. Yep. Um, so we're talking 1998 here but I don't think a lot of people know before you joined Wakefield you played for Hunslet. Yeah. I, uh, you had a big stint though, didn't you? Massive, massive. <laughs> Two games. <Kicked> me <laughs> <laughs> Two of the best games. <laughs> yeah. Two of the best performances. Two good games or bad yeah, games? Of course. Memorable well, games. how many offloads in the two games, Will? Yeah. Would have been a few, wouldn't yeah. it? Too many. <laughs> uh, well, I had uh, I had played for the Mariners the year before, the Hunter Mariners, and they closed the club down. So everyone in Super League and from Was the Mariners. Was that Super League War? Super League War. Yeah. So they'd... They had made up the NRL and Super League and come under one flag again. So the Mariners closed up. Everyone went off and found a, found a gig. I ended up at St George, um, got hurt early in the season, and I just struggled getting back in the team from then on. So I'd had the games to get a, a visa from the year before with the Mariners, and, and at that time you had to play something like 12 games. And I was getting close to not getting that number. And... I went to David Waite and I said, um, I've got a chance to go to England. I've got a chance to get some stability. At that time, we, had, we hadn't just moved clubs. It's about moving into state. It's about moving from New Zealand to Australia. And I had two young boys and it wasn't fair on them to keep moving around. And I knew if I came to England, I could get some stability. I sort of knew geographically that I could centre point myself and, and go to wherever. Have you been um, to England before at this stage? On tours, yeah. yeah I've been on a couple of tours. and um, I said to my agent, just try and get me over there, try and get me a visa. And um, just before the end of the season, he got me to Hunslet. And I had 
had two games to prove myself. And it was, it was a gamble going there. And um, we had to we had to beat Hulk AR in the last game. Swinton had to win by less than 50 or lose the game. Then we were in the playoffs. Mm. And we played on the Thursday. We went away and it got back to us that Swinton had won 50-odd nil. So that was my time done. We didn't make the playoffs. That's my two games. That's my, that's my season done with Hunslet. Had a quick discussion with them about possibly staying. Playoffs have happened. Um, I end up going home because my season's done. Wakefield end up winning the championship, winning the grand final. Come to Super League and my agent rings me and said, this new team, Wakefield and Super League, they want you to come across for two years. So I said, yeah, sweet, I'll take it. And we've been here ever since. Wow. Yeah, because you had a few years there, didn't you? This is late 90s, early noughties. This is, yeah, we arrived January 99. And, and how, bearing in mind, you know, you're now the head coach of Wakefield, how, how different a club was it to, what, 20-odd years ago back then? Uh, not a lot different. <laughs> 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 no, the, the people running it, you know, um, there's still a lot of the supporters that were there when, when I played. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of young people coming through now. And one thing I have seen, because I've lived in the area over the last 10 years or so, I've seen a lot more kids around Wakey wearing Wakey kit, mm. which has been massive, not just for the club, but for the game, mm -hmm. that we're spreading the word and we're getting more younger supporters to watch our game, which I think is massively important. Mm. But, yeah, there's, um, the backbone of Wakey has always been the, the fans and the supporters and the volunteers, and that's still the same now. We've still got people who you know, give up so much of their time to make our club work. Um, Michael Carter and John Minards, our, our chairman and CEO, do so much, you know, as much as they can yeah. to help the club be as successful as it can. And, you know, that's what the club has always been about. It's been yeah. a grafting club. It's been a club that's always tried to bat above its weight. Yeah, and I'm just thinking sort of timeline-wise because just before you joined, you joined Leeds in 2002. But, John, you were on the scene around 2001. Yeah, well, I, I just you? missed... I was playing full KR in 1999. I made my debut full KR in 99. So I'm just so thankful that it was a year after. Can you imagine me as a young... I was 16, I was like 75 kilos. Imagine coming out and Willie You bet you were a gobby as well. Willie, <laughs> Willie Poaching's opposite I bet you yeah. still had your mouth on you. It would, have bumped, it would have bumped me off about 50 times. So I'm just glad mm. I, I got time to get in the gym. Did you ever yeah. clash? Did you ever come together? No, we played against yeah, each other. Yeah, obviously Saturday in the late years in Leeds, but not, not in those years, not in the Wakefield no. and Hull KR years. No, no, no I was at Hull KR till I signed for Saints in 2002. Yeah. So, the, the, um, yeah. so it was just then three, four... You know, when, when Willie won the Challenge Cup, that was around the time when yeah. just trying yeah. to get your arms around Willie's thighs mm. were just, it's a you challenge. Like recently? Or? No, no, it was a challenge. You know, powerful ball carrier, offload the ball. I know Mark said he wasn't quick. I actually thought you were pretty quick. I was giving you a shot. <laughs> yeah. are, are you similar age? No, what are you? What? <laughs> uh, I'm a fair bit older. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, no, we, we crossed paths. Yeah. We crossed paths and Willie was just um devastating carrier of the ball, you know. Mm. Somebody who Thank you. you know you'd, you'd I didn't have, have John's pick. skill or kicking game, or you know, I had to rely on other things and some natural attributes that yeah. my uh heritage has given me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was that like then leaving Wakefield? Because you obviously fell in love with the place at first sight and you know, as we said earlier, you still live there now and not far down the road to to Leeds, tough. but Leeds came calling two. It was tough. It was tough. And tough to turn down, though, Leeds. In they came calling once before um, when Wakefield went into receivership and the club nearly went under. Um, and it was a tough time. It was, they split all the young fellas away and the older blokes went upstairs and they told all the older blokes, all the over-24s, that their contracts were null and void now. People like Bobby Goulding and Steve McNamara, and it was horrendous. They called three of us into the room and said, we're going to renew your deals, we're going to offer you new deals. And I didn't take it straight away. I, I felt a bit of loyalty to those guys. Um, and I tried to look around for something. And I think uh, we played Warrington, I think, that week, or the team played Warrington. And it was just going to be the kids. It was just going to be kids playing. And I, Something in me just said, I, I can't let these kids do it. So I, I said to Gary Hethington, um, not right now. I'm, I'm going to stay here for another year. Uh, the next year, 2001, we survive on the last game of the season. 
we beat we beat St Helens on the last day and we just beat Huddersfield by a point on the table to stay up yeah. and you know it was just so stressful all year mm. and I thought about shit so what Sorry, if I no, said, no, no, fine. Uh, what if fine. what if I'd gone to Leeds what was this and whilst I felt loyal to him I did feel bad it was still tough leaving the team um my wife was pregnant with another one, so we had a third one on the way. And yeah. I just had to do the right thing by us, by my family, and that's when I, I chose to go to Leeds. And, you know, I've never regretted it from day one. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting time, John, at Leeds at that particular time, because it was the, the dynasty was loading, was yeah. pending, wasn't it? You know, yeah. and obviously you got a grand final over the line in 2004, but I think after your injury and having to retire in 2006, they won five of the next six grand finals. It was it was the, yeah, no, the it was building just, blocks of something special. Yeah, well, it? all of that, that that younger generation, the academy at Leeds was so strong, wasn't it, Willie? At that time when you when you were there, the academy was for sure producing like the best players. And, and at that time, Academy Rugby was shown on Sky TV. You know, it used to be a time when Academy games were shown on Sky. And Leeds, Great, wasn't it? Leeds mm. Academy was incredible. Mm. Like, just had cherry-picked the best youngsters. Maybe one of the challenges for towns like Wakefield and Castleford and a lot of these areas was that at that time, Leeds just got the best mm. players from all of those areas. Yep. And they turned it into this super academy that just populated the team for, for sort of 10 years. For sure. It? Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't the case when I'd got there. You know, they were still in their infancy. And guys like Danny Maguire and Rob Burrow, I think they had played a couple of games the year before. So it was just about some of the uh, us older guys bringing them through. And yeah. We, we that, didn't know what was going to lie ahead. That's really important. Like John mentioned there, the, the academy and nurturing those young players through. But equally as important is having really um, strong leaders and characters like Willie and the other fellas that probably just nurtured them through and brought them along because teaching those values and that culture from a young age is really important, isn't it? Massively, massively. And, you know, what they learnt was, especially when Tony Smith came, was lifelong habits mm. that lasted the club for a long time. Mm. You know, and those guys, you know, a lot of them still live by those values and the way that we worked and the way that we conducted ourselves. Mm. It, it almost feels like the sort of, you know, the equivalent, the football equivalent of the class of 92, doesn't it? You know, where th these guys were, but I'm not saying that there wasn't an Alan Hansen moment where they said you're not going to win anything with kids, but those guys that you mentioned went on to be, you know, Hall of Famers, didn't they? For yeah, well, Simfield and, and Jones Buchanan were probably just before them, and, and Chev Walker, but then you got, you know, Mark Coldwood, Rob Burrow, Danny Maguire. Did you know that they were going to be the players that they were, as most of them? at that stage or not? We knew that they were talented. Yeah. We knew they all had their individual talents. It was a matter of us moulding it together mm -hmm. and, you know, being able to do it consistently and you know, getting that taste of the big time. We, we got close in 2003. We yeah. got picked by Wigan in the playoff final to... And you beat us in the Challenge Cup semi-final. Yeah. Danny Maguire scored a try in the yeah, Challenge Cup right. semi-final in 2003. That's right. Yeah. In the last minute, and yeah, Kev thanks. kicks the ball from the touchline. Yeah, yeah, I remember it very well, Willie. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Mark, you would have been, what, you know, 14, 15 this time, watching on telly? As, as, as John said, it was on Sky. It was kind of, this was yeah. the beginning of something special, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, I remember Willie fondly. I remember watching him at Wakefield. I remember seeing that dynasty be created at Leeds. And um, as a young man, it was quite inspiring to see mm. such, you know, icons of the game, yeah. Uh, Willie, so 33... 2006, you had to retire, you were forced to retire. Knee? Yeah, well, I, I hurt my knee. I, I did hurt my knee, which physically forced me out. But uh, for that first half of that, my last season, I was flying in my head and mm. I was feeling good physically. I was enjoying playing. Um, and I can't pinpoint a time or a moment when it happened, but mentally I just zoned out. I started to zone out and I sort of felt myself losing the passion to to train. Yeah. But that, what did that from the injury? Sorry, that came sorry, from. sorry. Yeah. What did that 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 interests me? This what you've just said there. That mm. moment, yep. right? There's a moment at which that you have to be so intense, right? Mm. You have to have this mental intensity and a will and desire to just keep pushing and keep pushing. And that went, didn't it? It, it was gone. Yeah, it was almost. Dreading driving to training, and when I was driving home, I was thinking, "Thank goodness today's done." Wow. Was yeah. that during the season or pre-season? It was during the season because the right. season, you know, like I say, I'd, for the first half, 
I was loving it, mm. and I thought, oh, I could go on for a while here. Well, that, was that because your knee was letting you no, down? No, nothing to no, do with that. No, my knee was just a freak thing in training. Right. Um, and I just felt like I shouldn't be feeling like this. I'm letting the team down by feeling like this. Mm. But I couldn't shake it. I, I couldn't shake it. I, I tried to train harder. When, you know, my form was rubbish by then because of everything that was going on in my head. Um, and then Tony Smith put me in a game against Wakefield. Played. Tuesday we trained. I just went to step like I normally would. Mm. And my knee just blew. It's almost like a sign, isn't it? I mean, look, you, you must have had a moment like that. Yeah, no, you know, no, no, at no, Toronto. No. When, or just when I was listening, I, I dealt with that maybe twice in my career. And once I got over it, and then the second time I knew... It, it, it was inevitable anyway, but I knew I was done. Once at Saints, once at Toronto. Yeah, once at Saints, like where. So 2014, when you do your shoulder. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, and just listening to you say that, I just put me back there. Yeah. There's, there's a point at which I think what you described there describes how everyone feels at the point at which they retire. Mm -hmm. You, you, it, you, you cross a line mentally, where you go, nah. Not today. That no. This is not me anymore. You know. That's it. And 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 I managed to wrestle myself out of it once, and then obviously second time, time was done anyway. But I think if you could distill that and give it to players at the start of the career and go, look, you'll get to this mm. point, and it's not For a sure. shameful thing either. No. It's actually I found it actually quite a, a, a relieving thing. I did as well. You know, when you get to that point, yeah. And I'm like, this is a relief. For like, sure. I've been pushing so hard for so long. And to feel like this now felt, it feels natural, will it? Yeah, right? mm. I remember uh, my last Mad Monday as a player and coming home um, and just sitting in the backyard a couple of days later thinking, I'm an ex-player now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and how did that feel? Because I mean, comfortable Mark, you've had the same was ready. as well, where, and I think you still went on for a good few years. You, you thought there was a moment like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, and you still played for another four or five years. But do you ever when you have those moments, then think back three, four years later and think, why did I do it then? I still had a few more years in me. Any of I always say that I'm pretty lucky. I've been pretty lucky to, to go straight into coaching and still be around the dressing room. Mm. So I'm around the atmosphere and I'm still amongst it all, um, which a lot of my mates that finished and went home or finished and went away from the game to nine to fives, yeah. from something we've done five, six years old up until 30 odd, mm to just stop mm. must be hard mm. but because I've been able to still be around the game and still be in the dressing room as I say um, I've had no regrets not one day of regrets I've I don't want to go out there and make a tackle anymore I don't want to get tackled anymore but you still but have I the still, environment haven't you I'm that's still, the yeah. thing yeah, I mean, yeah. Look, John, look, John you still have the environment because you're working for Sky you're still yeah. involved in your at games Mark you not so much well, I mean did you ever have any of those no, regrets I, th I think when you make that decision to retire there's two times it happens one is where it's not your choice right and I think when it's not your choice you leave something on the table mm. yep. and I think inevitably then you start to think could I should I should mm. I do more should I keep going but the point this is why what Willie just said is really important. He came to that decision by himself. Mm. And when you know, you know. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing to come to that decision of your own accord because it's, it's just a privilege you don't get in sport and in life sometimes. <coughs> Whatever job you do, you know, sometimes the pin gets pulled and, and you have it's to a, finish. Yeah, you, whereas, not, whereas when you get mentally to a point where you've given everything, You've exhausted your mental capacity to be good at something. That's a nice place to be. And it, and it will privilege in that respect, that I think. For sure, yeah. And, and Mark and as that's, well. That I, I reached that point um, during pre-season, because that's why I was interested to know your point, because pre-season's tough. We yeah. all know it. It's, every day is a grind. And after doing 13, 14 pre-seasons, I always had to be as fit as I could be to, to, be, to play at a decent level. And um, yeah, I just remember training and running and doing a conditioning session where you have to hit a line, get up and down off your front. And afterwards I thought, I'm just done with this. Yeah. But I had already invested enough time and energy and I give Salford my word that I'd play that season, that I'd carry on. But I, I was able to enjoy that full season and every away trip I'd, I'd sit in the changing rooms at Cass, it was a bit bit cramped or you go to Warrington and Saints, these great facilities. And I'd just look around the dressing room and really enjoy the moment memories, yeah, yeah. savour it and it was nice playing a full season it was during covid where uh, you know teams had their own issues and, and there was there was loads of stuff going on but 
I was able to enjoy training sessions, night outs with the lads, having a coffee together. I just really reveled in it. And then I just, I was able to hang, hang my boots up on, on my own terms. And you have such an unnatural mindset to play rugby league. Like for people who are supporters of the game or have played the game, maybe at amateur level or whatever, to play the game at Super League, your mindset's unnatural. It's not a natural thing to do. Every day, well, right, okay, go into this little room over here and wrestle like your life depends on it with other men. Every day. Sometimes days shirtless. We used to do it shirtless at Salford. Yeah. Run as hard as you can R into that full of it. And do it. And do you know what? Your rational mind, when you're young, you switch it off. Like, I could switch it off. You go, ah, oh, I've got no regard for my own safety. Yeah. I'm not bothered. The older I got, your rational mind starts clicking in and you think, right, at St. Helens, we'd, we'd be playing full contact stuff. Alex Warms is running the ball at you. And you'd start to think, <laughs> what, what am I doing? Yeah. This is so unnatural. And, and you need an unnatural mindset to want to do it. And that gets challenged every day. For yeah. professional sports people, professional rugby league players, I think in a situation where we don't get paid that much, it's not that glamorous in the UK and you're getting battered week in and week out, it's an unnatural mindset to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think for anybody who does it for a period of time, deserves respect of fans, of people who watch the game, of anybody who likes sport, because it's that unnatural. Mm -hmm. And look, to get to 33 is, <laughs> is an achievement. To get to 30, 33, 33, you know, what whatever you, you get. Yeah, whatever you get <laughs> to, whatever you get to. If you play more than a year, right? Yeah. It's an achievement, yeah. but we always view it as that you need a 15-year career to be successful. Yeah. Or something. yeah, and I suppose what you, what you got to have to do it, you got to love it. Yeah, you got to love, it. and that's probably was the difference. I had loved every moment of playing. Yeah, up until a time that I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. up until that time when I stopped loving it, and I stopped love training, stopped loving training. That's when I thought, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And, and just as you get out the war zone, as it were. Um, so you know, just as, you know, six, seven years later, 2013, you're working for, for Warrington Wolves as an assistant coach. Yep. Under Tony. Yep. You had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, take us back to that moment, January 2013. Yeah, January t 2013. I uh, didn't know we were going here. <laughs> um, yeah, just woke up one morning as normal to go get ready for work. Um, went into my son's room to grab something, bent over and just... Felt like I'd have stabbed on my back and continued getting ready. Uh, thought I had heartburn, had a glass of water, nothing moved. Said to my wife, I think something's wrong here. She rung, rung the ambulance, come around, did some ECGs on me, and yeah, I was having what they call an event. So yeah, just had a blood clot. That um, It's taken a little while and a couple of events, events later to sort out. Um, but I think we're, we're down to the bottom of it about, I've just got a, a blood disorder. How, sc how scary was that moment when you, you, you yeah. uh, try and describe the actual kind of, was it, it was an out of body experience? You said it was a clot, it was a building, I didn't know. black. It was I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know until I was off the operating table. Um, all the way through when the doctors are checking me, I didn't know what was happening. Um, then I went down, they stick the tubes in, they clear it all out, you're back upstairs and the nurse says, do you know what's happened? I said, no, nah. you just had a heart attack. That what listening the hell? To that, listening to that, that's a big thing. You know, for somebody to say that to you is a, young, yeah. a youngish fella, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, how did that, how did that feel? Shocking. Yeah, yeah. Shocking. Yeah. A bit of embarrassment Yeah. Um, when why, it happened. Why, why embarrassment? Oh, just young. Yeah. Oh, not, long been a, not long being an athlete, you know, and still trained a little bit. Um, and it took a little while to get the answers. So, yeah, um, scared. Yeah, yeah. Scared at the same time. Scared for my kids. Were, were you more scared when you, you found out? I, mean, you, you, I assume you knew this before, but your dad had heart, heart issues. Yeah. And obviously yeah. hereditary. And, yeah, it's, for it's, sure. It's scary. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, my boys, because it's more hereditary in, in males and the genealogy, so I've uh, had to get my boys checked. Um told my brother to go and get checked. So, yeah, um, been pretty good, touch wood, so far. And, you know, we've had some really good specialists that have helped us get some answers mm. and get to the bottom of it. So, 
Yeah. And what answers did you find? Did it, did it change your perspective on life? For a little while, but you can't let it hold you back too much. You know, there's still some moments if I train and I get a little bit out of breath, it scares me a little bit. Mm. But at the same time, you've got to push through it and, and carry on. And, you know, that takes a little bit of time and, you know, and I, yeah, it's... Uh, Did it give you a different viewpoint in terms of, you, you mentioned your three boys and, and your missus and kind of slowing down a little bit and appreciating life even Oh, yeah, more. yeah, yeah. You know, you get an appreciation for everything then. But, yeah, without trying to put it behind you, you like I say, you've got to move on. You've got, you, life's got to go forward and I try not to let it hold me back or restrict me too much, but... Like I say, I've had some really good specialists that have helped me out. It's taken a little while, or well, it took a little while, but um, I think we've found the answers to everything because to start off with, nobody knew what was going on. That must be scary. It was, yeah. yeah. And when, when I asked one of the doctors, I said, you know, what's caused this, what's happened? Thinking the normal answers, heart disease, whatever, it's just, it's just a freak thing. Mm. It's just, it's just and those were her words, it's a freak thing, I thought it'll be a one-off. Mm. So... I went back to training, started again in October of that year, and it happened again. Right. So, like, don't don't bullshit me. This is a freak thing. What's mm. going on? Yeah. So, just had to try and work on getting the answers. So, well, it's been the last sort of 10, 15 minutes. We'll push it a bit longer. Um, talking about the, your, your coaching because I'm I'm fascinated. It's, it's great, isn't it, to get a coach in? Yeah. And, and yeah. Again, yeah. we could have done the whole hour where you're on coaching. You have to come back and talk to us. But bearing in mind you were uh, an academy coach at Leeds, you then went on to be assistant coach under Tony Smith, as we mentioned, at Warrington, and assistant at Salford, where you met Mark Flanagan, who was yep. even better looking back then, wasn't he? He was more of a, a 10 out of 10 back then before the, the scars and so on. And Hull KR as well, assistant coach. How hard was it for you to become a head coach? 15 years hard. Mm. And I've got no regrets. Um, toughest were the early years. Um, but I wouldn't change it for a single thing. And I'd say to every young coach that comes into it, to invest that time. Um, I think I spent four years coaching reserve grade and under-21s as it changed through the time at, at Leeds, um, which meant that there were some early starts, sometimes 6 o'clock starts, 9.30, 10 o'clock finishes, because you're doing first team in the morning, you stick around, and then you've got the reserve grade and the young fellas in the evening... And to do that for four years takes a lot out of you. But the lessons that I learned were invaluable. The lessons that I got out of it, and probably the biggest lesson I got early doors was, yeah, it was something that I wanted to do. Was that always the vision? Was, was the dream to be the head coach? And I go back to Eddie Poaching and all those young years where you've seen him influencing young yeah, people's I, lives. And I so went on. to Newcastle as a 17-year-old, and things didn't work out, but I spent a couple of weeks there. And... We ended up coming back. Three of us went over myself, a guy called Brian Lomatia, who ended up playing for Cronulla, and another fellow called Tana Rumanga. Oh, yeah. He wasn't a bad player, was he? he wasn't a, we all played junior Kiwis together, and we ended up coming back. Um, things didn't work out. Tana went to rugby union and kicked on. Brian, as I say, went to Cronulla. And from the lessons that I learnt on that trip, I probably learnt more on that two weeks. And this has not been disrespectful to New Zealand Rugby League or the coaches at the time. Just the thought process of and the detail they went into and what we learnt from the coaches in those two weeks just amazed me and I took a lot of that back and that lit a fire in me to keep being a sponge and keep learning and you know get in a position to well, coach and pass on knowledge. Have you ever felt and this is a you know, massive question again something that could be talked over uh, the space of an hour but have you ever felt held back in your journey to becoming a, a head coach, being a person of colour? And, I'm, and I talked to many footballers about this, and you would have heard a lot of these names, Paul Ince and Les Ferdinand, and, and people who've just felt that they were never given the same chance. And it, it, obviously we've seen it in the NFL with the, with the Rooney Rule, yep. and thank God that came in, and that's actually evolved the Rooney Rule. Originally it was to, uh, have to, to enforce yeah. the 32 NFL sides to interview, interview, interview one or person or of colour. Now it's in, or involved the whole in the process, role system. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. For, for you back then, did, did you think that that was a roadblock for you? Not really. Um, I didn't see it as a stumbling block. I just thought, and I, I still feel this, I, I think it's tough 
for young English coaches to get a gig. Um, most of them, as it was in my case, go from an assistant to head coach within the club mm. that they're at. Very few um, go from assistant at another club to a head coach at a Super League club. Mm. I think Brian McDermott did it from Leeds to London. Richie Marshall did it from St what? Helens to Salford. Um, there haven't been many, and it's difficult. And I think it's too easy for the powers that be to jump on a plane and go to Aussie mm. and interview someone. Um, had that not been the case of what yeah. I'm talking about, um, would Lee Radford have got a job? Would um, Ian Watson have got a job? You know, some of it is timing. Would somebody have, what I'm saying is, would they have been given an opportunity to get a job? And, um, I have th thought about a similar Rooney rule for us here in Super League that clubs have got to use or interview an English coach in the process mm. to give our young English coaches an Because we've got some great coaches here. And I, because I've only coached here, whilst I'm a Kiwi and I'm Samoan and I'm proud of it, I'm only coached in this country. Mm. I see myself as one of those as well. Mm. An English coach that's invested my time here and given my time. So it's more the NRL's held on a pedestal as opposed, as opposed to Super League in terms of well, coaching lessons and, and well, some, some coaches are coming part of an NRL team. Mm. But yeah, I, I think so. Mm. You know, that's always been how it's been. Yeah. It was how it was when I was a kid. Yeah. Australian Rugby League was where you had to go to make it. It's, you know, they did everything so much better and they had so much better players and... Should, should but some we, of our coaches have some good values. The numbers, though, Willie, and, and look, just uh, again, yeah. the most up-to-date numbers I could find. You know, according to some figures from 2021, so a year ago as we record this, 60% um, of NRL players are non-white, so an estimated 12% uh, Indigenous Australian, making that close to 50% from the Pacific Islands. So, so few Pacificers have, have gone on to be, to become coaches. Yeah, you know, it's something I'm proud of. If we can get more. If we can get more to take the step, I, I know there's a lot of players or ex-players that want to go into management. Um, we've got, uh, at this moment in time, Mortutoni does a great job for New Zealand Rugby League in an administrative role. Um, so does uh, Frankie Pulitua with the NRL. Um, they really fly the flag for us. Nigel, Nigel Vanganar. Nigel Vanganar yeah. was with the NRL and New Zealand Rugby League. Um, you know, those guys have really laid a platform for all the others to go. And we, we just need people to break the walls down for a bit. Yeah, you, know? a, you need a path, don't you, to follow sometimes in life. I think, like, if the path has been trodden and that you create role models then and people can follow you down that That's track. Right. And I think the biggest moment is the first appointment. And from that, you know, I think naturally it will yep. follow. I think it, it's very difficult to break down. I think people... Actually, more young Samoan or Pacific Island players would consider being a coach when they see visible role models who are coaches. Mm -hmm. I think that cycle's very hard to break when yep. there are no role models there. Yeah, or there haven't don't been get me wrong, models. John. We're shy by nature. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're pretty quiet people, which is why we sort of like our own company. Yeah. Um, but it shouldn't be down to you guys to shout from the rooftops. No, no, but there are the others that aren't so shy. There are people that are willing to, to take on these roles. Um, we, you know, there's a lot that do have some strong leadership qualities and values that will you know, be great coaches. As John says, we've just got to give them a path to follow. Mm. How do you... I've asked this to so many coaches. I remember asking it to, um, to Brian McDermott, and he really struggled to answer it. How do you describe yourself as a coach? Yeah, I was trying to think coming over. Uh, Do you want me to answer this? Because I, obviously yeah, Willie's coaching me. It, yeah. um, so firstly, I think I congratulated you when you got your, the wakey job because when he worked with us for a year at Salford, I always knew that Willie could be a head coach and I always hoped he would be because we had a good relationship and I knew that you had a great insight for the game and you had a good relationship with the players, so which are two of the, the main facets of a great coach. But I think um, you have some coaches that shout and ball and they can be quite aggressive or dic uh, like dictators in, in a dressing room. But I think you, you're quite softly spoken, aren't you? And you, um, you do a different approach. But I think that gets more buy-in because you're on side with the players. It's not a, a them and us kind of mentality. I think you kind of create a, a, a w harmonious dressing room. So I'd say you, you're very good at nurturing a good team. 
And I think secondly, you've got quite a good insight into an expansive style of rugby. You like to throw the ball around and be expansive. No, cheers, yeah. And yeah, that's some of what I'm about. Um, I was a footballer, I like to play, I like to yeah. offload, and, and I thought the game deserved to be played that way. And one of my roles as a coach, and it was as a player, is to uphold the values of our game. You know, we, we who are involved in the game are guardians of it, and we've got to represent it the best that we think is the right way to do that. And, you know, some of the values I have as coaches, as coaches, you know, I work with young men and try and make them the best people that they can be. You know, we all trip up. We all have moments of, uh, of madness, if you like, but just trying to make them great people. And I think the best people that I played with, the best players, were, were very good people. And that, yeah, there's no coincidence that that goes hand in hand. What's what's the hardest lesson that you've learned then as, as a coach? What's what's the most difficult situation you've come across so far? The most difficult and the most important thing, John, is honesty. Just being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, be upfront. People see through bullshit. You know, and, um, they respect honestly. Honesty as as long as you've got that, um, somebody might. Um, struggle with the honesty for a little bit, but they respect it in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, sorry, I want to know, have you given any bollockings out? <laughs> do, you, do you have a hairdryer in you? Yeah. I'd yeah. like to see that. Um, yeah, I did on uh, Warrington early in the year, and you don't have a lot of these. You don't have a lot no. as a coach because it just becomes reverberating sound yeah. after a while. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it's noise, isn't it? It loses its value um, and its power. Yeah, I, I did it at Warrington away, um, and I didn't know after the game, Kylie Luluai uh, rung me and he'd missed most of the game. He was trying to find the credit card to pay for the pizza, so it was in the office that I that I knew was on the other side of the showers for his at own, Warrington. For his, his own pizzas. pizzas. Yeah. Buying his own pizzas. <laughs> for the pizzas after the game. And uh, he said, bro, I heard you yelling. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, I just had to give it to him at half time. And he goes... Bro, I had to crack up. I said, I didn't see you in. I didn't see that in you, man. I didn't see that in you. But yeah, it's got a it's finite it. resource, that though, isn't it? Like yeah. you said, I, I it is. That's coach, really coach, yeah. you use the hard stick too much. You stop listening, yeah. Yeah. And, and it loses its weight. Well, the best, the best. My, my ears immediately went to Sir Alex Ferguson. Yeah, because obviously he used it a lot. And no, he didn't. No, I know he, he didn't, didn't use it. But the, he his, his most impactful one was silence. Yeah, no, no, but if he said nothing, also they were more scared. I think. He, used, he got renowned for it, but I think when you listen to the class of 92 talk about it, mm. I think that is once a season, twice mm. a season, yeah. mm. once to an individual yeah. on his own, you know, in a season. So you're pulling that so, red cord, so you know you've got one a season. I, I like yeah, yeah. The, the, sometimes it's like a parent, it's worse to be told that they're disappointed in you. Yeah. For someone like Willie, who's probably respected in the dressing room at Wakey, for him to say, I'm disappointed in you, you let yourself down. Sometimes that, it's harder, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Players are proud as well. So, like for me, when um, you know, honesty, right? I agree with it. Honesty is number one, right? Players respect it. Coaches respect it. Fans respect it. That's the only thing you can do. Yeah. So I always found coaches that couldn't give you bad information or tell you exactly what you needed to know because they're scared of upsetting you. I always found that was really tragic. Like mm -hmm. it had a bad effect on yeah. on the team and on individuals. And I just think. It's, look, I, I've got the utmost respect for coaches. I couldn't coach. I, I would like to think I could, but I couldn't. And, and the challenges of being a professional coach are like varied daily. You're dealing with different egos, different characters. You're appeasing a board, a chief exec, fans, uh, all, whilst also like forensically scrutinizing your team's performance, looking ahead for it. It's, it's a tough, job, Willie, isn't it? And I think maybe players sometimes think, and we always do this in sport, why did good players not make great coaches? I think because it's a misunderstanding of the time and dedication that you need and your 15 years of, of, of that embryonic part of your career. It needs a dedication to become good. You're not just going to walk from a career to become good at it, are you? No, not at all. And, you know, something as big as coaching, like I said to you, firstly I had to find out whether it was what I wanted to do and whether I was passionate enough about it. And, you know, I, once I learned that I was, and that's why I persevered so long and, you know, I worked with some fantastic people who taught me lessons as well. Yeah. 
You know, the players taught me every day and um, the head coaches that I worked under even more so. You know. Can I just ask a question? So you, you touched on perseverance there. Um, so for 12, 13, 14 years, you were doing the rounds coaching. You did a year at Salford. Then after Salford, you, after being an assistant coach, you went to Huddersfield for a little bit. And I th Correct me if I'm wrong, were you doing the academy or the reserves or you were doing bits of coaching but not probably to the same level? Yeah, well, I left Huddersfield and it was late in the season mm. and every other staff roster had been filled up. Yeah. Um, so it took some ringing around. I was without a job for about three or four yeah, months. I remember, I remember speaking to you. I think you said you're out of a job. So for to, to, to be at that level, then to struggle for employment yeah. and then for it to come full circle again, you must have had to persevere and believe yeah, in your I, ability. Yeah, I ended up going to Huddersfield on a part-time wage. Yeah. Um, and I was told, Andy Kelly, who was my old coach at Wakefield and worked at Huddersfield, said, said, just be careful. Be careful of your hours. But I knew I, knew I couldn't work part-time. I knew I couldn't coach part-time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I worked with um, Simon Wolford and Luke Robinson with the first team um, the whole year. Um, but again, I've got no regrets. Um, we, we struggled for the year. It was, it was a tough year financially because I was, you know, I was on a pittance. But again, I don't regret the lessons that I got right. and the grounding that it's given me. And I was thankful to Tony Smith to take me back on at, at Hulk AR. COVID hit. Yeah. And, you know, like every everybody in the game, every club in the game got hit financially. So I knew there were going to be changes there. And thankfully, again, Chris Chester, who I worked with at Hulk AR, got me to Wakefield. And mm. That's how I've ended up back there. Yeah. Four minutes from home. Perfect. Staying off the four, motorway. Four yeah. minutes. <laughs> four minutes. Four you know. minutes how far meters? I need to know meters. How far? Do you ever break the four-minute mark? You get into the 357. No, not yet. There's a there's a bugger of a set of lights that I keep catching. <laughs> there's <laughs> one set of there's lights. He's got one set, set of lights. There's, 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 light, the, there's the lights outside mark. Sainsbury's that... As soon as I come around the roundabout, they're red <laughs> they, every day. They see you coming, don't they? <laughs> oh, Willie's coming, red. <sighs> do, 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 obviously, as a head coach, you've only been at Wakefield two minutes. Do, do, have you already thought, as a coach, you know, interesting that you said that, that a message in a dressing room can only reverberate so many times throughout a season or you know, when you lose your shit, etc. cetera. Um, have you ever thought about the outstanding your welcome as a coach and taking a team as far as you can as a coach and when that next step comes as a coach? No, nah, well, I have thought about it. But that's a long way off. No, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously time, yeah, but, no, that, but that, no, that, that moment will come eventually somewhere. That is a fact. That that happens. You know, that's probably why Sir Alex was so successful at keeping rotating the team around mm -hmm. and keeping the fresh ears and the fresh minds in the dressing room. And your lieutenants and your assistant coaches. Yeah, and, and you're getting you know new messages and learning all the time. Yeah, you know, that's and important. How ambitious are you as a coach? And like, this isn't me trying to get you to say, oh, one day I'm going to leave Wakefield and I'm no, going to take I'd, you know leads to the grand final, but you were as a player and it was about getting to the top and you did that and you have that in mind as a coach and yeah. I'm thinking again back to, to your dad and what he would yeah. be thinking of you now and, and uh, how long yeah. you've got left because you know, you've got 30 years as left as, uh, in your coaching career if you want it. Yeah, well, I just want to be one of my teams especially to be as successful as they can be on the field but players individually to be as successful as they can be the best dads they can be be the best people that they can be be the best sons that they can be and I'm That'll translate to the team being successful, I hope. You can already see that the Coach Carter, Eddie, Dad, yeah, I'm just, coaching is rubbed I, off I've just him, got this, it? you know, Make in the vision, people, in the vision just... of his dad, just Willie driving around, picking the lads up, bringing them to training. <laughs> Tom Johnston, <laughs> Tom, on, where are you? I've, I've slept in, right, I'm coming to get you. Yeah. I've got a camper van, I'm coming round to pick yeah. you up. But, but it's timing, you feet said feet timing up. before, sorry, Flash, you said timing before. Timing's huge in a coaching career, isn't it? Because it can, it can work for, sure. for you and it can work against you as well. Yeah, no, and it's tough to say right place, right time, because it's unfortunate that someone did loses a job as great as Chris Chester was to me um, and giving me two jobs and um, giving me a couple of opportunities. It was him leaving that opened the door for me yeah. to take it on initially as, as interim and then you know now as the head coach. But yeah, timing is massive timing and where you are and what you're committed to and you know being being around the right people yeah and, and the, re the reality of it is what is the 30 jobs in the world i don't know roughly you know yep. some whatever that that is a tight market to be in isn't it for sure so i think the biggest 
sort of challenge is not only timing but opportunities and and, and yeah and then once you get it you've got to make the most you gotta, of it you got to hit it and you? yeah. you're constantly judged on progress you know the statistics are so massive now in sport that every season oh look well we dropped off by a margin you know and it's about those marginal gains as dave brailsford would tell you <laughs> and if you don't hit them you, you're judged and it's like well look, for sure we need to go in a different direction yeah, yeah and, and you know the biggest Games are looking for a results, aren't they? Yeah. And do you know one thing I found really interesting is when I started working for Sky, we get like a stat report, you know, on the teams and, and it's got like a coach's, you know, review and a win percentage of coaches. And it blew my mind how little there is between win percentages of coaches. You know, you'd think it'd be like, let's say, for example, I'm just using Christian Wolf would be 75% and somebody else would be 20 they're all, it's like 48 to 52. It's like, it's like Formula One, isn't it? It's, it's there's nothing like in it. Yeah. It blew my mind. I was like, God, the margin of, of, of you know, being deemed great or not, it's a few yeah, yeah. percent. Mm. It's not like a big wide open. So I all respect to anyone who coaches and to Willie and, and all of his fellow professionals who coach. I think it's to put yourself out into a limited market, a challenging job in one of the toughest sports in the world. Look, it's it's nothing but respect from from me and yeah. as, uh, and all the players and hundred percent, yeah. Good on you, Willie. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us. No, thanks pleasure. for having me, Jim. Taking you right back to, to no, again a good. childhood which we knew nothing about. We got right back there, didn't we? we? Did, yeah, you didn't like, expect that, did you? The, those no, moments, not that, some of it. The, those <laughs> no. moments that mer you know that that sort of forged you as a, as a child are fascinating because you can yep. see it today in what you're trying to do. And even at the end there, you're saying that you're trying to not just coach these guys to be the best rugby league players that they can be at Wakefield, but the best humans that they can be. And that comes from your dad and the influence that you had and, yep. and that rubbed off on you. So thanks so much for coming in and speaking to us, William. We wish you all the best, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Um, and look, give us a little follow. I always do this sort of beggy moment at the end, don't I? It's just not beggy. It's not, it's not desperate. Ge Are you going to do another review this week for, for yourself? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'll have to. Uh, yeah, you've done. Uh, that's that's the, the sort of levels that we had to. to yeah, you gave to yourself five stars, to. which which was good. I gave, I gave us five stars. We're still four point eight, so there's plenty of people out there giving us, you know, <laughs> under five stars, um, and, I, and I'd like to know why. Um, and again, if you just want to say something about John, uh, can you get four point five, or is it four no, or it's five? Four or five. Yeah. So, so we're so more so five than people four. Yeah. yeah, just yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For every one, five, four, we're getting four five. Yeah. Uh, look, Quite we're not so. back for three weeks, so you have to sit tight, but we've got a good guest coming for you after that. And uh, look, three weeks to, to burgle John's house. He tends to go to bed around 9.30. Pink flower pot. Uh, I'll put the address on the Twitter handle. See you next time.